unmute myself first. How can we become godly? This morning we began a series of studies looking at what the Bible says about godliness. Uh, and I want to recap briefly the main point that we notice about godliness for those who maybe were not with us. We looked at that early hymn that Paul quotes in his first letter to Timothy. Slap bang in the middle of that letter, Paul pauses and writes about the mystery of godliness. Uh, and it's a mystery that has been disclosed and it's all about Christ. Now let me pause here and ask you, listening here on Zoom and those of you who may be clicking on the video later, whether that fits your beliefs about spirituality. We live in a time when there is an increase in interest in spirituality. Uh, a lot of people have given up on institutional religion as they see it, but they don't want to be materialists. They're not sure what they believe about whether there is a God or what it might be like, but they're sure that there must be more than meets the eye. And they're right. And if that's you, you are right. There is more. We can't prove it using scientific instruments. It is a reality that's beyond the merely natural, and so it's not accessible to science. But that does not mean we cannot know whatever is out there. Neither can I prove to you that the Bible is the word of God. There are good and sufficient reasons to believe that it is the word of God, that God actually inspired the words to be written down for our benefit. I can't prove that to you right now, but the proof of the pudding is in the eating, isn't it? So if you're not sure, stick with me. Listen to this message and feel free to interact with me. Ask questions. You can use the church email address, which is on the website. What we are told in the sacred scriptures, the Bible, is that there is indeed a reality outside of the natural world. And these same writings tell us that by ourselves, we cannot have any kind of access to that reality. But we're not by ourselves. God is actively involved in this universe and he's told us what true spirituality is. We're told that it's all about the Lord Jesus Christ. The implications of this are huge. It means that you and I can be spiritual people. You too can be godly it's for ordinary people like you and now i want in this message to look at another aspect of spirituality or godliness and that is the pursuit of godliness do you want to be a more godly person god tells us that we can pursue godliness god speaks to us through his servant, the Apostle Paul, in the same letter that we looked at this morning to Timothy, and he writes this, but you, man of God, flee from all this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. So godliness is something we can pursue. It's something we're told to chase. It doesn't just land on our laps. Earlier in the letter, Paul tells Timothy the same thing in a different way. He says this, have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives tales, rather train yourself to be godly. For physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. Do you work out at home or in the gym or the pool? Nothing wrong with that, Paul says, physical training is of some value. But godliness has value for all things. So train yourself to be godly, says Paul. Now, it might make you wonder that if you can train to be godly, maybe it's not so much about Christ after all. If you can train to be godly, then surely it's more about us, isn't it? Some people work out every day, others once a week. Some do high intensity workout, others not so. If that is true in physical training, then it must be true in training to be godly. And if there can be such a difference in the way people train to be godly, then maybe the mystery of godliness isn't about Christ after all, but it's rather about you and me. Thankfully, the Lord hasn't left us in confusion, but it has made it plain for us, as we'll see over the coming weeks. The passage of scripture I want us to look at this evening is not specifically about godliness. It's about salvation. 
The two concepts are related, as we'll see later on. But for this evening, we will learn a lesson from this passage that will help us in understanding godliness. So turn with me back to the passage that I read earlier in Philippians chapter 2. Paul's letter to the Philippian church, uh, chapter 2, and I'm going to reread verses 12 and 13. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Now, when Paul writes to the believing community in Philippi, they're going through a bit of, a, bit of trouble. Paul loves this church, as we saw last week as well. Whenever he thinks of them, a smile comes over his face. Did you see that in chapter 1, verse 5? He says this, uh, verse 4 and 5, In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. He's filled with joy whenever he thinks about the Philippian believers. But he's also filled with confidence. You see that in verse 6. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. And he's, confidence, and he's filled with confidence for them, even though they're experiencing some friction. Note here that his confidence is not based on their great track record, but on God's promise of his ongoing grace in their lives. Now, skip back to chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. And here we see the same thing again, but with more elaboration. Here is Paul. He's not able to be physically present with the believing Philippian community. Imagine Stephen Clark in a few years' time in Cyprus, finding out that two of the women in our church are not getting on. So he pens a letter to us all. That's the kind of thing that's happening here. And Paul calls them beloved friends. That's the word his, that's used there. In the NIV, it's a bit, bit weak, dear friends. But the word is there, beloved. He calls them beloved friends. And he tells them two things. There is a command and there is a fact. So let's look first at the command and then we'll look at the fact. How can we paraphrase this command? Here's how I might do it. Paul says this, don't just stand there, do something. So let me first make sure we don't misunderstand what Paul is saying here. He's not saying that what Christ has done is not enough for us to be saved. When the Lord Jesus died on the cross, then his blood paid for our sin. We can really say that if we're trusting him, we in him, we are saved. But the Bible also makes it clear that salvation is something that is ongoing. So see what Paul writes uh, in chapter 1 of Philippians there, just the same page maybe, uh, verse 27 and 28. Whatever happens, he says, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel, without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved and that by God. So their salvation isn't yet complete. Although they're saved already, he can talk about them being saved in the future as well. So what is it that we're supposed to do? How should we work out our salvation? three things so there's a three sub points in this under this command first is this we work out our salvation by being obedient when the lord jesus was about to return to his father in heaven he instructed his disciples he gathered them together and he said this he says all authority is uh, in heaven or on earth has been given to me therefore go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey all that I've commanded you. So you want to be a disciple of Jesus? Then do what he said. The disciple follows the master. 
Do you see that at the beginning of chapter, uh, chapter 2, verse 12 there? Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, these Philippian believers have a track record of obedience. Now, he says, continue that work. I wonder if there's anyone listening here who is tired of following Christ. Perhaps you feel that it's just become too difficult for you. Or maybe you're finding a conflict of allegiances within you. You know that the Lord would have you live his way, but you also love sin, to be frank. Brothers and sisters, remember what happened to people who went their own way in the past. Remember, for example, Achan. You remember what happened to him in the book of Judges. The people of Israel were told to take Jericho and to completely destroy the, uh, the place and not take the plunder for themselves. But what did Achan do? He saw something shiny and it was gold and he saw silver and he saw some fancy Babylonian fashion, uh, uh, fashion wear and he, and he took it and he took it to his tent and he hid it under the ground. And in doing so, he rebelled against the Lord and he shipwrecked his soul. That's what happened to Achan because he didn't obey the Lord. And remember King Saul, he was told to wait until Samuel the prophet comes, but he didn't. He took matters into his own hands and went ahead and offered the sacrifice. And Samuel rebuked him, didn't he? To obey is better than sacrifice, he says. Have you ever thought to yourself that you will sin now and then make it up to God by going to church more, or by reading the Bible more, or by giving more money to church. If you do, you're walking a very dangerous path. Think about the catastrophic consequences that came from the sin of Adam and Eve. All they had to do was obey the Lord and paradise would be theirs forever. But they coveted that fruit and ate it, and we have all suffered the consequences ever since. Sin has consequences, but so too does obedience. Verses 14 to 16a, let me read those verses. Do everything without grumbling or arguing, so that you may become blameless and pure. Children of God, without fault, in a warped and crooked generation, then you will shine among them like stars in the sky, as you hold firmly to the word of life. There are consequences then for obedience also. So remember this too. You will never regret being obedient to the Lord. Next time you feel the pull of sin in your soul, remember that obedience to the Lord's command brings joy. That's what ego, uh, Paul was eager for the Philippian believers to recover. The tension between these two ladies was blunting the spiritual edge of this community. If they were to regain their joy, then they needed to do what was right. When the apostles were being intimidated by the religious authorities, this is what they said in Acts chapter 5. I'll just read a few verses to you. Peter and the other apostles, other apostles replied, we must obey God rather than human beings. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed by hanging him on the cross. God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and savior, that he might bring Israel to repentance and forgive their sins. We are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. You want to be filled with the Spirit? Obey the Lord. But I expect some people are thinking on these lines. I thought we were saved by grace. Listen to what Paul writes to the Romans. In chapter 6, I'll read a few verses there. What then shall we say because we're not under law, but under grace? Sorry, let me read that again. What then shall we say? Shall we sin because sorry, shall we sin because we're not under law but under grace? By no means. Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one you obey, 
whether you're slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you have come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. Something happens then for us, to us, when we put our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Has this happened to you too? You receive fullness of joy in believing. You come to understand more and more of what Jesus has done to save you, and it thrills you. If you were like me, you were trying to get into God's book, good books by being religious, by doing good, by being obedient, and it didn't work. Because without the work of the Spirit in our hearts, everything we do is corrupted. But then we come to understand the good news and trust in Christ, that his good works count for me. His good works count for me. And we come to know Christ for salvation. But this is no cold knowledge of facts. It's a knowledge that produces love, ardor, devotion to the Lord. Do you have that? If you don't, then I wonder if you're really saved. If we are really saved, then it's not that we no longer sin. We can't go through even a day without sinning. But we hate it. We really do love God and we really want to obey him from the heart. And heartfelt obedience will never disappoint you. You will never wish that you had succumbed to temptation, that you had not obeyed. You will always be happy that you chose to do what is right. And that's why Paul is saying, in effect, don't just stand there, do something. I said that there are three things for us to learn here about how we should work out our salvation. Here's the second, with fear and trembling. You see that in verse 12? Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Why should they be fearful and trembling as they live a life of godliness? Paul here is picking up on a theme that he's already introduced a few verses earlier. See that in just a few verses earlier then, in chapter 2, verses 9 to 11. Paul is talking about the Lord Jesus Christ here, uh, who's come into this world, made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant. And then he says in verse 9, Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus Christ then has been exalted to the highest place. Every knee shall bow to him. That is awesome. It's not something to be taken lightly. Do you take these awesome realities lightly? Jesus Christ is on the throne of the universe. One day we'll all stand before his great white throne and we'll bow before him, the great king of the universe. Men and women, we should never take obedience to God lightly. Do we really think we can just rock up in front of God when he judge, sits to judge the universe? It should make us tremble. This is how the writer to the, to the Hebrews puts it in chapter 12. Verses uh, 18 onwards, you have not come to a mountain that can be touched and that is burning with fire, to darkness, gloom and storm, to a trumpet blast or to such a voice speaking words that those who heard it begged that no further word be spoken to them because they could not bear what was commanded. If even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned to death. The sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I'm trembling with fear, but you have come to Mount Zion to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Therefore, verse 28, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful. And so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. For 
our God is a consuming fire. So it's not just Paul saying this, it's other writers in the Bible too. God wants us to pursue obedience to him as an act of awesome devotion to him who sits on the throne. So that's the second thing, fear and trembling. The third aspect of our working out our salvation is that it happens among God's people. As you listen to this message, do you feel that obedience to Christ is just too difficult? Do you feel such a strong pull away from Jesus that you think you can't resist it? If you do, remember this, you are not alone. It happens to us all. It's the pull of the flesh. We have desires that are not worthy of a child of God. They're with us still and they battle against our souls. But note here what Paul is writing, not just to the two ladies who can't get on, but to the whole church. That is important. We were never meant to live out the life of obedience to Christ as mere individuals. It's true that we do come to faith as individuals. We individually have to put our trust in Christ. No one can do that for us. We can't be saved just by believing in a belief or just by being in a believing family or by having Christian friends or joining a church. We as individuals must believe in the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. But we don't do that as isolates. None of us is just called to be a lone ranger in his battle against the evil within. We're saved to be members of the family of God, the church. So although we're called to do a workout for Jesus, this is not really like being in a gym. You know what it's like in the gym, rows of treadmills, rowers and cycles, and everybody doing their own workout maybe with their earphones on, uh, and everybody is in their own little bubble. No, the pursuit of godliness is more like being on an assault course. Have you ever been on an assault course? You crawl through mud and you under barbed wire, you swing from monkey bars and crawl through pipes, and, and then you get to the wall, and it's a big wall, 12 feet high. You can't do that as individuals. You need to do it as a team. It's the only way they're going to get over that wall. And that's what a godliness workout is like. We're in it together. So if you feel overwhelmed and you feel that you just want to jack it all in and stop following Christ, remember this. We are all called together to get to live a life of obedience. Paul told the Galatians to carry each other's burdens. And in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. Don't try to do it alone. Reach out to your fellow believers, your brothers and sisters, and together we can pursue godliness. That's one of the reasons it's so vitally important that we keep meeting together. And that means, if we can, staying on for breakout rooms too, because then we get to interact together. So that's the command that Paul gives to the Philippian believers and for us. Don't just stand there. Do something. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. That's the command. And now here's the fact. The fact is this. It is God who works in you. You remember how Paul is confident that God has begun a good work in them. We saw that in chapter 1, verse 6. God is determined to save them to the end. Chapter 1, verse 28, we looked at earlier. Why? We're told that God is at work in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. That word act is actually the same word work as earlier. To fulfill his good purpose, his good pleasure. And, and that's what God's good purpose really is. God's pleasure. How can we tease that out? Do you ever feel like God has given you a load of rules for you to keep? And you just have to grit your teeth and get on with it. That's not what true spirituality is all about. As we have seen already, godliness involves the heart. And that is why God is involved in us. What is he doing? God is transforming our hearts so that we want to do his will. God doesn't break us until we do his will. 
I hope that I'll not spoil an old novel for you. It's been around for over half a century, so don't tell me you haven't had a chance to read it yet. 1984 by George Orwell. Many of you have read it, I'm sure. The protagonist in the story, Winston Smith, lives in a country ruled by a totalitarian government that tracks everyone's movements and seeks to control all their thinking, as well as their actions. Smith doesn't like living in this society and begins to rebel in small ways at first, and then in bigger ways, until finally he's found out. Uh, and then begins a process of re-education in which Smith is slowly broken of all his will to rebel. It's a powerful and very gloomy book. Do you think that God is like the totalitarian government in 1984? Do you think he just wants to control your every thought and break you every free thought that you have until you obey him like an automaton? Look again at this verse in chapter, in chapter 2, verse 13. For it is God who works in you. God is not working against you like an implacable enemy or on you like a manipulative interrogator or behind you like some megalomaniacal puppet master. No, God works in you so that you desire to do his will. Your will comes to fit with his will. So that what you do, your actions, your work, conforms to his. Do you know about pilots? I don't mean the person who flies a plane. I mean the person who guides a big ship in and out of harbour. When a big ship is ready to leave harbour, the captain calls for the harbour pilot. The harbour pilot then is an experienced officer who knows the layout of the harbour and all the potential hazards that lie beneath the surface of the sea. And he comes on board the ship and he makes his way to the bridge, the control room, where he takes over the command of the ship from the captain. All the time that the pilot is on the ship, the captain willingly does what he's told. Why? because he knows that the pilot has the ship's best interest at heart. Now that's probably an imperfect illustration, but it may help us to understand how it is that God can work in our hearts so that our will is not broken. God's work in you doesn't violate you. Do you ever meditate on the fact that God takes pleasure in you? Don't you find it amazing? that the creator and sustainer of the universe takes pleasure in little old you. You are the apple of his eye. It's wonderful, it's glorious. Think about that this week when you get down. Meditate on the glorious reality that God has a good purpose for you. And it is God's pleasure that you live for him. Paul knew what it was to live for God. He knew that living for God meant pursuing the knowledge of Christ Jesus. Let me read a few of his words uh, as we finish in cha from chapter 3, verse 8 onwards. What is more, I consider everything a loss, he says, because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and, the, and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I've already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenwards in Christ Jesus. Paul wants to know more then of the mystery of godliness. And he wants you to know more of that mystery too. He wants you to know more of Christ. Do you want that, brothers and sisters? Then pursue Christ, because it's in pursuing him 
that you will grow in godliness. Amen.